<laughs> you know, my um my laptop is actually gonna die. Uh-oh, okay. We're almost there. We're almost there. I want you to be this one, Rach. Yes, just barely. Okay. All good? Okay, I'm going to exit out of this. You can stay there and I'll just look at it from the back the entire time. Okay. Okay. Here you go. Yep. Okay. You're recording? Yes. Okay. All right, it's taking me a minute. Okay, cool. My name's Erica. I work for Harvest Pierce County as a program manager. I manage um some of our some of our farm programming. Um I've been with Harvest Pierce County since November of 2021. And this is my third time now uh, teaching this class. Um, but it's my first time teaching in person. So if you could give me some grace, that would be cool. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. Um, and we're going to talk about some seeds. You want to introduce yourself? Did you already do it? Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Lex. Um, so I'm the AmeriCorps uh, volunteer with Harvest Pierce County this year. Um, I started uh, in September, so coming on the end of my first month. Uh, it's my first time on this uh, class and moderating, and uh, we obviously already did a run through, but uh, it's pretty fascinating. I'm learning along with you guys, uh, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Cool. And so um, just a little bit about Harvest Pierce County. Um, we... Um, Recon reconnect communities to each other and um, to their environment by cultivating community-based food systems. Um, we focus on education, connection, and equity, and we strive to center historically underserved populations um, and prior prioritize projects um, that work to increase food sovereignty. Um, this Edible Gardens class series is um, a partnership between us and the Pierce County environmental educators, um, the and they um, are a program within planning and public works at Pierce County, um, and they serve their customers through waste reduction, recycling, sustainability, and sustainability education. Um, it happens through virtual and in-person school programs, um, evening and weekend adult and family programming, attending community events, and in a multitude of other ways. Okay. Um, does anyone have questions before we start? No? Okay. Um, so we just want to take a moment to pause and give attention to the land that we're all on. Um, people at home um, can reference this map. Um, they don't know whose traditional lands they're on. Um, and um, I'm going to read our land acknowledgement um, since it's not on up on there. Um, I don't know why it's not showing, like, but that's okay. Anyways, um, so we acknowledge that the land um, now identified as Pierce County has for thousands of years been the traditional territory and home for the Puyallup Nisqually um, Squaxin Island and Muckleshoot people. Today, this land is still home to these four federally recognized tribes. We recognize them as past, present, and future guardians of this land, both culturally and legally, as evidenced by their respective treaties. Uh, we acknowledge these tribal governments and their respective roles today in protecting and taking care of these lands and resources. We commit to working together and stewardship of their homeland where we mutually work and reside. We further recognize that 
that land acknowledgements are not a new practice. They are an indigenous practice that honors the land and people who have stewarded it since time immemorial. I'm also gonna add um, that the um, Silicon tribe is not federally recognized, but is also in um, the land that's now identified as Pierce County. Cool, so um, this is class one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, out of nine, four, out of 10 um, for the Edible Gardens class series that we put on every year with um, the Pierce County Environmental Educators. Um, there's there's two more after this, if anyone is interested um, at learning how to put your garden to bed and um, learning a bit about fruit trees. Will those be taught by us or, um, or who else would be teaching them? Um, I believe Harvest, Pierce County, is teaching the putting the garden to bed, and I'm not sure about the fruit tree one. Um, feel free to take some notes. Um, note taking is like really super important for seed saving um, and just farming and gardening in general. You don't have to take notes if you don't want to. We will send out um, a summary of what we go over today along with some resources. Okay. So some of our learning objectives for today is to um, know the difference between family, species, and variety. Um, well, I'm not gonna read that, you guys can read it. Um, um, but yeah, there are some key, these are the key points that we wanna hit today. Um, and just know that I'm not an expert seed saver. I have some experience saving seed, um, but I just wanna, um, I'm here to go over the basics um, and support you all in your seed saving journey through sharing what I've learned um, and providing some further resources as well. Okay, so why save seeds? Um, when we participate in seed saving um, and keeping seeds, we are um, giving ourselves and our community power. Um, uh, and uh, some power, and that power has been sort of like taken um, by our kind of broken agricultural system, which heavily relies on big, uh, just like a couple big companies um, for sourcing our seeds. Um, and seed saving is crucial to like all forms of sovereignty. Everyone has to eat, we have to eat to survive. And so keeping our seeds um, gives us power back in that way. And then, um, also saving seeds that are um, acclimatized to our our um, location is super important, especially with um, with the different microclimates that we have around here um, and with the changing climate as well. Um, yeah, and it has and will continue to be crucial for our ability to feed each other and ourselves um, as our climate is changing. Okay, so um, some taxonomy basics. Um, it's important to know the species of a plant um, for seed saving. That's the most important thing for seed saving is to know your plant's species. Um, the, so yeah, knowing taxonomy basics um, provides us with very important information about the likelihood of cross-pollination between plants. Um, and this assists us, like knowing taxonomy basics helps us as seed savers with planning our gardens. Um, the species of a plant is generally defined as a group of organisms that are able to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Um, scientific names, uh, which are the names in italics, um, specific where is my note? Scientific names um, precisely identify plants um, and plants that belong to the same species can um, sexually reproduce with each other. And this is why knowing the, the name, the um, species of your plant is so important for seed saving. 
Um, da, 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 da. And yeah, so sorry, I'm looking at a different slide than you guys are. Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So for these examples, um, we have the like common name or the variety name on, on top. So that would be Baltic Red, Prestige, um, Mad Morska, and Western Front. Underneath them is are their um, species names, their scientific names. And uh, so they're all in the same family. These are all brassicas. The important part is that it's the second part of their scientific name. Um, and that tells us which ones can cross pollinate with each other. And that will help us um, determine where um, where we plant things in our garden. So these, these two at the top, uh, even though this one's a kale and this one is a rutabaga, they are the same species. So they can cross pollinate. Um, and so you wouldn't want to plant them right next to each other if you were trying to save seed. Um, same with the two bottom ones, um, this kale and this cauliflower. Um, however, you could plant these two different types of kale right next to each other. And since they're not the same species, they won't, um, you won't have risk of them cross-pollinating. And um, yeah, and then we can just look at some other examples. So these are obviously all peppers. Um, yeah, just some, just some other um, examples of different um, species names and do, do, do. You go to the yes, here's just some more um I think with winter squash especially um winter squash was the first um experience that I had with planning out like where I was gonna um plant stuff and I I I just thought it was so fun that you could grow two different two um, different varieties of pumpkins um, and they like couldn't breed with each other. I didn't know that. And I thought it was, I don't know. I just thought it was fun. So like this, um, that real big one up there. Um, and then this potty maroon um, one, winter squash. These ones can, can cross pollinate. Um, anyways, yeah, you can see. Um, which ones can, which ones can't. Does this make sense to everyone? Okay, cool. So yeah, those are just some basics um, and you will need to know their their um, species name for planning. Um, right, okay. So now we're going to talk about um, some flower anatomy. Um, this is the flowers of a of a plant are the fruit and seed producing um, part of the plant. Um, there are three different stages of sexual reproduction in plants, which is pollination, fertilization, and then fruit and seed onset. Um, this flower up here is called a perfect flower, meaning that it has all of the necessary parts to um, reproduce. Um, not all of flowers are perfect flowers. Um, we'll go over some examples, but um, some important parts to know about flower anatomy are, um, so the, the stamen, which it consists of the filament and the anther, that is the male part of, of, of a flower. And then um, the pistil, which contains the ovary, the style, and the stigma, is the female part. Um, so the um, the anther, that those blue little curvy guys, um, those uh, are where the sperm cells are contained, and they produce um, pollen grains that that contain the the sperm cells. So the pollen will be produced by the anther, and um, the stigma, the top of the flower here, this yellow part, is the part that receives pollen from the anther. Um, once the pollen is received there, it um, travels down the style to the ovary. Um, the ovary has the um, 
egg cells and it produces um, seeds and becomes the fruit. Um, is I gonna say about? No, I think it's okay. Um, yeah, so the, in order for um, fertilization to occur, um, the stigma must receive pollen from the anther, which contains the sperm cells um, and the egg cells in the ovary will develop into the seeds and then the ovary itself becomes the fruit. Um, yeah, so that's why like, if you think like about a tomato, um, it has, um, you know, the flower will like eventually fall off um, but that's why the flower is sort of on the bottom. Like, okay, this is a tomato, this is a flower. Um, the the ovary is contained, you know, you see right at the heart of the flower. And so it grows it grows real big um into the and becomes the tomato. And then once it's big enough, uh the flower like withers and falls off. Making sense? Any questions? Okay. So there are different methods of pollination. Um, and um, there's inbreeding and then outcrossing. Um, since self-pollination is a plant mating with itself, it's always a form of inbreeding. Um, so like with a perfect flower, um, that is inbreeding. It's um, called self-pollination. It's sometimes they're referred to as selfers. Um, and so, um, yeah, inbreeding plants or self-pollinating plants, um, is really great for pollination. There's, um, a very high likelihood that pollination will be, and fertilization will be successful. Um, but the genetic diversity of those plants is not super great. Um, and then with outcrossing plants, um, um, yeah, outcrossing is when a plant is fertilized um, by the pollen of another plant. Um, and typically the, the, these plants have imperfect flowers, um, meaning that a single flower doesn't have all of the necessary um, parts or all the necessary sexual systems for pollination and fertilization. Um, and these plants, the outcrossing plants tend to be more genetically diverse um, than the inbreeding plants. And so they're better adapt, uh, uh, they're better set up to adapt to changing environments. Um, but then the, the offset of that is that um, pollination is a little, um, a little bit harder for outcrossing plants. And then we've got some examples um, of inbreeding and outcrossing plants. Yeah. Okie doke. Okay, um, so not all flowers are the same like we talked about. Um, some plants have um, those perfect or sometimes they're called bisexual flowers um, that have both male and female reproductive parts, which are like we talked about the stamen and the pistil. Um, other plants have both male and female flowers on each plant um, while others will have male and female flowers on separate plants. So this tomato is a is an example of a perfect flower. Um, and then the corn is an example of a plant that um, has male and female parts on on separate um, parts of the plant. Um, and then um, spinach is an example that of a plant that of, or of a species that has um some of the plants have the female parts, some of their some of the plants have male parts, but they're never contained on one plant at a time. Um, okay. doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, um, and so knowing the anatomy of your crop's flower will help you um, in planning and management of your seed garden. Um, yeah, and what else? So the, the pollination method and um, flower anatomy is crucial for seed saving um, because it helps to inform us 
on how to lay out our seed gardens. So if you're growing spinach for seed, you'll want to pay attention to the dispersal of the female plants and the male plants. Um, before pollination occurs, you wanna make sure that you have a good mixture of them. Um, and then if you're wanting to save like corn seed, um, you want to look out to be sure that you have enough plants close enough together to ensure that the pollination can happen from the tassel to the silks that come out of the ear. Um, and then for tomatoes, which self-pollinate, um, you don't need to, um, to fuss too much about how the plants are laid out um, as long as they're all the same variety so that there's no um, worry about cross-pollination. Making sense? Okay. Um, so most plants don't fall perfectly into one category of um, pollination methods, but there are there's wind pollination, there's self pollination, and then there's insect pollination. Um, obviously, wind pollination um, is when uh, the pollen is carried from um, the stamen of a flower um, via the wind um, until um, it reaches the sigma of the flower to receive that pollen. We talked about self pollination and what that means, and then insect pollination is when um, you know uh, insects are um, traveling from one flower to another and um, catching the the um, pollen on their bodies and transferring that way. Um, some um, some examples of wind pollinated. Um, Plants are like wheat, rice, corn, rye, barley, and oats. Um, Self-pollinated plants are tomatoes, peppers, and beans. And then some um, some insect-pollinated plants would be like squash, cucumber, eggplant, okra, um, melons. Um, yeah. And so, oh, that's okay. Um, it's my water. Oh, can I have it? <laughs> Thank you. I'm just gonna take a sip real quick. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, just kidding. I need another sip. Okay. So we're gonna briefly talk about open pollinated versus hybrid seeds. Um. Um, I actually, I also want to point out um, where never mind. <laughs> never mind. Um, okay, so yeah, we're we're gonna briefly touch on some open-aided, open pollinated plants versus hybrid plants. Um for the for this class, we're gonna like focus on open pollinated plants. Um, but some things to know: um, open pollinated varieties are um, those which, if properly isolated from other vari varieties of the same plant species, um, these will produce um, seeds that are genetically true to type, meaning that um, the seed will result in a plant very similar to the parent of the seed. So, um, meaning. Uh, True to type just means that the the plant that's produced by the seed that you have saved will will be the same plant um, genetically the same plant as its parent plant. Um, and then hybrid seeds are um, are intentionally crossed plants. Um, so uh, they. And that just means that that the seed, if you collect seed from a from a hybrid plant, they're much much less likely to produce um, seeds that are true to type, um, and that is important for um, for seed savers to be aware of. Just because um, you can you can save seed from hybrid um, plants, it just takes um, more generations of the plant, and it's like a lot more advanced. I've never done it. I've never saved um, from a hybrid plant before. It's quite difficult, um, but but then there's also um, you know there's 
um, a lot of benefit to hybrid seeds as well. Um, some of them, you know, like are better at um, dealing with pests or disease, or some of them are just super delicious. I don't know if any of you have had sun gold to made cherry tomatoes before, but those are like a very popular hybrid seed that um, that a lot of seed savers have attempted to, you know, um, save seed from so that we could have an open pollinated variety. And um, some of them are close, you know, but they're not, they're not quite as good as um, the hybrid variety of, of that. Um, so yeah, we're gonna focus on open pollinated varieties for this class. Make sense? Okay. And people can put questions in the chat too or comments. Um, okay, so going back to um, talking about um, pollination and different methods of pollination. Um, Pollination? That's starting to not sound like a word to me. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's important to know um, what, how your plants get pollinated um, because it will help you determine the different types of um, isolation tactics that you'll want to use. Um, so there's um, distance, time, and containment tactics of isolation. Um, distance is the... Yeah, isolation by distance is the most common and easiest isolation tactic. Um, so if you're growing plants of the same species, um, you would isolate them by keeping them apart um, to lessen the likelihood of cross-pollination. Um, so um, the distance that you would, that you want um, between plants of the same Species varies um, depending on the pollination method, um, but generally self-pollinating plants will need the least amount of distance and wind pollinated plants will need the most distance. Um, and then there's isolation by containment. So like with the, um, this example is some okra. Um, okra is insect pollinated and so, um, so in this example, some tight netting was put around the plant before the flowers developed, um, ensuring that the insects that were already on the plant and on the ground around that plant stay on just that plant and keeping other insects away from it. Um, and then you would keep that on until pollination has occurred. Um, Yeah, and you can do this um, with like an entire plant, um, like individual plants or multiple plants um, or even individual flowers to decrease the likelihood of cross-pollination. Um, yeah, and there, there are many different methods of, of isolation by containment. Um, and then the other type of isolation is by time. Um, this is the most difficult method um, and uh, is recommended for more seasoned gardeners. And the concept here is to plant varieties of the same species, um, which pollinate at different times next to each other. Um, so this example is corn. Um, so you would like plant that variety, whatever it is, was like planted first when, and then when it's, um, the second and third, um, and so you're you're timing them, um, knowing like what time their their flowers will produce. But um, there's a lot of factors that can go into that, um, just depending on the weather and the season. Um, so it's pretty touchy, pretty finicky, kind of risky, I think a little. Um, I tried it out once and I was successful, um, but I don't think that, that was really due to anything special that I did. Uh, it was just like luck, really. I planted an early, um, an early pollinating uh, variety of popcorn, and then I grew some dent corn next to it that I knew would be, that wouldn't be ready um, until like later in the season. Um, so 
I, I think it was just kind of dumb luck. Um, honestly, I was like, well, I'll just try it out. And if it doesn't work out, then I won't save the seeds. Um, but I was able to save the seeds. Um, but, um, yeah, for the most part, I personally just do, um, isolation by distance. Um, alternatively, you can just not grow plants of the same species and then you don't have to worry about it. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so this is a chart from the Seed Savers Exchange that I reference for my seed saving. Um, the most important parts of it are the recommended isolation distance and um, the population size. Um, so you want to have a genetically diverse pool of plants or you want your you want your seeds to be genetically diverse um and in order to do that you need to maintain a population size a good population size to get that genetic diversity um and so it, the recommendation is different for different kinds of plants um and yeah so these are these are the recommendations um and the the reason that um we care about the genetic diversity is um um, in the in the short term, um, more genetic diverse seed means that our plants will be more adaptable to um, our changing climate or weird weather conditions that happen um, or pests and things like that. And then in the long term, um, genetic diversity improves the overall health of a variety and creates a stronger foundation um, for potential um, breeding that you might want to do in the future. Um, yeah, and this will, this, um, the link for this will be sent out, um, with the, with a follow-up email after the class. Um, yeah, does this all make, oh, oh sorry, it's okay, going to the next it's okay, <laughs> does this all make sense to everyone, so like, for the, I don't know why I'm trying to see it up there, it's so hard to look up there, um, so for the top one, this uh, bean, um, um, oh, actually, the oops, I'm gonna stand up. This, this, I should have circled this column as well. This one's really important. Um, so for yeah, this top bean, um, it's a self-pollinated plant, um, and the recommended distance just means that you want, um. You want 10 to 20 feet between that variety and any other variety that is the same species of that plant. So it doesn't mean like between each plant, um, but in order to make sure that there's no um, cross pollination, don't plant other species or don't plant other varieties of the same species uh, any less than 10 feet um, away. And then, um, yeah, for, so for um, the number of plants that you need for this self-pollinating plant at the top, or viable seeds is just one because it's self-pollinating plant. Um, for, for the variety maintenance, meaning um, that's more like short-term um, variety maintenance, um, you would need 10 to 25 plants. And then um, to preserve the genetic integrity of that plant over a longer term, you can need 15 or more plants, at least 50 plants um, for that. That makes sense? Yeah. Now you can go to the next one. Um, just from my understanding, yeah. no one's asking questions, but I'm trying to follow along as well. Yeah. Um, the plants that I'm most familiar with are the Nebraska oleraceae. It's mm -hmm. my favorite. <laughs> um, so basically, if I wanted to plant broccoli and cabbage, because they're both Nebraska oleraceae, I would have to plant them between 10 and 20 feet apart from each other. This is because they're the same genus and species, right? Um, Not necessarily 10 and 20 feet apart. Or whatever's recommended. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Even if you're not wanting to um, save to seeds. save the seeds from both of them, okay. Um, but even if you're just wanting to save seeds from one of those varieties, you would want to spread them out 
Okay. But if you're not saving seed, you know, then then you can plant them right next to each other, but that's a different class because this is a seed saving class. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Glad I'm following. That. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your questions. All righty. Um, so roguing um, just means pulling plants out of the ground that you don't want to save seed from. Um, you want to do this um, more than one time in the season, ideally. Um, and you want to do it before um, flowering happens. Um, the reason that you would pull plants is um, to, to collect the seed that you want to see. Collect the seed that you want to see in the world. <laughs> um, and so maybe you're maybe you're wanting to collect seed that is um, more like drought tolerant. Um, and so maybe you're like watering the plant a little bit less um, than you would otherwise. And you're looking to see um, which plants do well under those conditions and which ones don't do well. And so the ones that aren't doing well, um, you want to assess whether or not that's because of an environmental factor. Like maybe there's lots of pests in that area um, or um, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe the, the irrigation isn't working um, or isn't reaching that plant. Um, and so, yeah, you just want to assess whether or not it's an environmental factor or if it's a genetic um, reason for that plant not doing well. And if it's a, if you determine that it's a genetic factor, then um, you'll pull that plant um, so that it's not um, contributing its genetics to the, to your seed. Um, uh, and then you want to keep in mind that you, you do want to maintain the recommended population size um, through roguing. So you want to plant a little bit more than the, than the recommended um, amount for um, keeping that genetic diversity. Um, yeah, and then you, you, you rogue to improve or maintain the integrity of that variety. Um, so maintaining it would just be um, like you're growing it and um, you just you just want to save the seed and you're not necessarily looking for anything in particular like um, drought tolerance, like I mentioned before. So you would just grow it the same way that you normally do. Um, and you take out the plants that aren't doing well under those circumstances, or if you're trying to improve a certain um, aspect of that plant, then you would you would stress it out a bit to see how the plants react. <sighs> okay. All right. So you've you've done all the things. You've done your roguing. Your plants are have all grown up, um, and now they're ready to be harvested. Um, um, so um, dry fruited just means that you're harvesting them when they're nearly completely dry on the plant. Um, so that's like. Um, like beans, um, corn, um, different types of oats, things like that. Um, so yeah, you want to harvest those when they're dry and you'll, um, there's a couple different ways to, um, get the seed off of the plants and then also cleaning the plants. So, um, for, for the dry, the dry fruited plants, you will, um, you can do threshing, which is what they're doing in the top here. And um, I'm not entirely sure what these people are harvesting, but it looks like it's some type of grass. Um, so they tied it all up together and they're just whacking it on the ground on a tarp. Um, and that loosens the um, the seed and just makes it a lot easier um, to collect. I've seen um, some like smaller scale um, methods of threshing, like, um, I've seen some gardeners put their plants, like, in a, in a pillowcase, and just, like, whacking the pillowcase, or dancing a little jig on the pillowcase, um, that'll help get the seeds off, um, and keep them contained, uh, yeah, um, and then, so, yeah, you can do that with, like, different types of grasses, um, like beans are a good one uh, that you could dance a jig on top of. 
um, uh, you know, like corn, you wouldn't, that it wouldn't really work with corn. Um, you kind of have to like really get those kernels off the corn by hand. Um, and then, and then there are other, um, there are different methods of cleaning the seeds. So you can use screens, like in this example here, different size screens, you know, starting big and going down smaller um, to get the debris away from the seeds so you can store them. Um, and then this is my favorite um, method. It's called winnowing. And what you do is you take the seed. Oh, ah, that's what I brought this here for. This is some dill seed that I saved. Um, I've, I've cleaned it up quite a bit, but it's not um, not perfectly cleaned. Um, you might want to stand and show it to the camera like that so that people online can see that. Look at my seed. Yeah, I'll stand um, in a second. Um, but the idea here is that you're taking um, your dirty seed um, from one container and pouring it into another container uh, with some distance and wind. Um, some form of wind. So you can use the actual wind outside. You can use a fan like in here, or you can use your breath. Um, that's how I started cleaning these seeds. So, stand really. What? Stand facing the camera. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and you know, you can do it with, with just one, um, one bowl if you're using your breath to clean the seed, but you just go like this. as you drop them and you miss uh, and you make a mess. Um, but um, hopefully you don't have like a projector in your eyeball when you're doing it and you do it a little, little nicer. I have some, um, some poppy seeds here as well that are mostly clean. There's some debris in them um, that you can. What's the purpose of using the wind? To get the seeds uh, clean of debris. Okay, so the debris blows away and the seeds fall. That's that's the idea. Honestly, this dill seed isn't the best example because they're so light. Um, but these poppy seeds are a better example. They're a bit heavier. And so you would just go like this with a wind source. Um, and that cleans up your seeds. I, I really love doing it with um, after I've collected my corn seed because um, they're just so messy and it's really fun to watch all the debris like kind of float away like gracefully and you know if it's sunny outside it looks really pretty to me um yeah, <sighs> yeah. questions on that i feel like it's kind of straightforward yeah okay and then um harvesting and cleaning um fleshy fruited plants um this would be like tomatoes, melons, peppers, da 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 da. Um, plants where the seeds are um, contained in, in the, just like wet flesh. Um, <laughs> that sounds gross. <laughs> um, but yeah, so with uh, what? Just gonna adjust this real quick. Okay. So that way the online viewers can get a better view. Okay. Um thank you. Ooh. Um yeah, so some of these um need to be fermented. Um so like tomato seeds need to be fermented a little bit before um they will be viable. So what you'll do is like in this example, you cut it in half, sleeve out the juice into a container, um, and then you'll just let it sit for a day or two. It doesn't need to be super fermented. Um, everything it needs to be fermented is already in there. there um, it's got wild yeast in there and it's got sugars, um, so you don't need to add anything. Um, and then you'll just strain it out and um, line it out um, so it can so it can get dried up. Um, and once they're completely dry, you can um, store them. And then with some other um, fruit like like melons, uh, you just scoop them out and uh, just strain them a bunch with like water. Um, and then you can uh, dry them up and save them. Um, I I have some like pumpkin seeds here, which are um, similar to melon seeds. And I actually, I didn't clean up the flesh too much before I dried them. I kind of let the fleshy part dry up on the seed 
um, and it just made it a little bit easier to clean up. So that's what I personally like to do. But the main goal here is just to get the seeds, um, just to get the seeds dry and clean. Um, and then some um, some plants that need to be fermented a little, um, they can sort of ferment on their own in the plant. Um, so if you're harvesting your, your tomatoes later in the season, you might not have to um, strain them or ferment them in a separate container. Um, it's just sort of up to you if you wanna take the risk of um, not fermenting them in a container, but sometimes you will get viable seeds because they can ferment, like I said, inside the plant. Um, and then some other um, wet seeded plants that need fermentation are cucumbers, um, uh, musk melon, and winter and summer squash need to be lightly fermented. Um, and like I said, like I I've never intentionally like fermented my um, winter squash seeds outside of like in a separate container. Uh, I've just sort of let them stay inside uh, the fruit for longer and they've always ended up okay. Um, and then, um, but many wet seeded fruits don't require fermentation. Um, and some examples of that are tomatillos, um, husk cherries, um, which are also called brown cherries, eggplants, watermelon, and some varieties of squash as well. Um, so once you've harvested and gotten them clean and dry, um, now we need to store our seeds. Um, you don't want to ever use an oven to dry your seeds, even on its lowest setting. Don't dry your seeds in an oven. Um, um, you can, uh, so yes, to, to store them, uh, you can use like silica gel packets in a jar or um, rice or charcoal in a jar. Um, you can put them in bags um, that are like hung out on a line and um, that will help get them all the way dry before you put them into a more long-term container. Um, you can use drying racks and stuff like that as well. Um, but can you go to the next slide? I'd like to ask you something. Okie dokie. Um, so I'm in the process of saving some seeds to start because I moved here just about a year ago. It's called Powder Garden yet. Um, no update on if it'll work because I'm still in the process of saving, but I've been saving my pepper seeds by like extracting them, washing them, putting them in a dry paper towel and letting them dry out. And then I put them in this wooden box that I have with some silica gel. Mm -hmm. And I did that a couple of times in my old state and it seemed to work just fine. Um, mm -hmm. It looked like, you know, just any normal pepper seeds. Um, that's the only one I've tried it with so far because I feel brave with <laughs> uh, doing peppers because they're supposedly easy. Yeah. Um, but that's also another like option if you don't have any females because I'm still working on building up my repertoire. We still haven't even like fully furnished our house yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, that's also another option, which I guess is similar to like drying in bags and stuff, but I just have like a drawer full of paper towels with labels on them full of different seeds. Okay, cool. Uh, it seems to have dried them out just fine. There's no or anything. So fingers crossed when I plant them, they, uh, they do well. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's good. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. And then here on the screen are just some um, seed storage tips. Um, uh, the, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, the, to maximize a seed's longevity, um, you want to keep them dry um and as cold as possible um you also want to keep them out of uh light and minimize their access to air so make sure they're in a tight container and um like as dry as possible um before you put them in the container um and you also want to minimize any changes to the condition of, of where you're storing them at um, to make sure that insects and rodents can't get to them. Um, the Unfortunately, this is in Celsius and I'm, I forgot to write, oh wait, no, I didn't. 
sorry, hold on. So, okay, for for short-term storage, you want um, to store your plants at about 40 degrees um, Fahrenheit. And then for long-term storage, um, you want them to be like, um, negative 0. 0.4 negative 0. 0.4 I guess um that degrees right. Fahrenheit um uh that's not a like requirement um but just know that the long the colder um your the colder your plants or plants sorry <laughs> the colder that you store your seeds the longer they will last um yeah so Keep them cold, as cold as you can. Uh, I know um, a lot of farmers store their seed in a refrigerator. Um, and and this is just like, this is just a suggestion. I, I do feel like um, it can sound kind of daunting, um, like when you're first learning about seed saving. Um, it's actually not as hard as it sounds. Like um, these are just, these are ways to, like really maximize um, the longevity of of a variety um, and the the viability of a seed. Um, but you know you can also just like um, grow your tomatoes and and take the seeds out, dry them up, put them in a container, and they're gonna be okay. They're gonna be just fine as long as they don't get moldy. Um, and then um, so, so yeah, we just want to go over some. Planning for seed saving. So this is what you want to think about before you plant your garden. Um, you want to ask yourself how many varieties of the same species um, you'll be growing. Um, you want to you want to know how the plant pollinates, um, and you want to consider how you can lessen the likelihood of cross pollination from the plants that you want to save seed from. Um, and then you. Um, you also want to ask yourself uh, what what you're looking for from the seeds, um, like I was talking about with like dry, drought tolerance or um, frost tolerance, things like that. Um, and then you just want to think through um, what your process will look like um, from harvest to storage, um, so you can plan well. Um, for yeah, for keeping your seeds um, as happy as possible, so they can produce plants for you in the future. Um, and yeah, any questions? Yeah. Anyone on the internet have a question, comment, concern? Nothing so far. Okay, that's fine too. You don't have to have questions. Um, if anyone does have questions, just let me. We can chill for like 10 minutes if anyone has questions yeah that sounds fine but yeah thus concludes our 101 class on uh seed saving um yeah my name's erica hernandez once again uh if you have any other uh follow-up questions you can always um email me or give me a call um there's my info and yeah happy seed saving um it's really, it's really important to save a seed. I believe that with my whole heart. So I appreciate everyone um, coming to coming to this class to, to talk a little bit about how we can get started doing that. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we will send out an email, I think on Monday or Tuesday um, with a summary of everything we went over um, and some links to to the charts and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm going to stop the recording. Go for it. That ended up being a good thing that, that I accidentally taught the class twice because the first time was not as smooth as the <laughs> second time. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I have some seeds up here if anyone wants to look at them but um no pressure this is also this is um an amaranth and i meant to bring it up when i was talking about brushing um with amaranth like you can 